Hi everyone, thanks for joining me today and welcome to this new lecture which will be on KM theory and the stability of the solar system. So in some sense this is a continuation of a previous lecture I gave on stability of periodic orbits in billiards and there was one result, this KM theory which I only alluded to and today I want to give more details on that. But one of the motivations for this theory was actually to study the stability of the solar system. So you may wonder why this is a question at all, because at school probably we all learned about Kepler's laws. So these are three laws that the astronomer Kepler proposed based on observations by astronomers and these laws say three things. So the first one is that the trajectories of the planets in our solar system are ellipses with the sun being at one focal point of each ellipse. The second one is this law of areas saying that equal areas are swept in equal times. So this implies in particular that planets are faster when they are closer to the sun. And the third law is a law that allows to compare parameters of different planets. And it says that the square of the period of a planet is proportional to the third power of its semi-major axis. And later Isaac Newton actually justified these laws in the sense that he showed that his law of universal gravitation had these Kepler's laws as a consequence. So where is the problem here? Well, it turns out that this is true only if there's only one planet in the solar system, maybe the Earth orbiting the Sun or Jupiter orbiting the Sun, or it is true if we ignore interactions between planets. So if we have a solar system with two planets and each one is attracted by the Sun but we neglect the attraction between the planets then these laws are correct. However the attraction between planets creates some perturbations and strictly speaking Kepler's laws are no longer true. Now the Sun being much heavier than any planet in the solar system, these corrections are very small. And this means that it has no important consequence on the dynamics on small time scales. So actually the uh, orbits of the planets are still very close to satisfying Kepler's laws. But the question arises of what happens on very long time spans, so like several millions of years. And astronomers have been aware of this problem for a long time. And in particular, around 1800, two well-known astronomers, mathematicians, physicists, the French Laplace and the Italian Lagrange, were able to do some computations that showed that the orbits of the planets in our solar system are linearly stable. So what this means is that if you assume that the planets are on a periodic or quasi-periodic trajectory, meaning a superposition of periodic motions with different periods, then if you linearize the equation around this orbit, so it means that you add a little perturbation and then you write the equation for how the perturbation grows, but just to linear order, then you find something which is stable. Now, a while ago, I talked about stability of periodic orbits in billiards, which can also be seen as fixed points of some power of a certain map. And I said that there were different main types of uh, periodic points. There are those which are hyperbolic and these are unstable. There are elliptic points which are linearly stable, but it's not easy to analyze the nonlinear case. And there's a borderline case, which is parabolic orbits, which is more difficult to analyze. So here we are in the elliptic case. 
which is somehow good news because it means that at least for a certain time the orbits of the planets of the solar system should be stable but it doesn't imply that the solar system will stay stable forever. Now in order to explain what mathematicians did to analyze this problem I will resort to some much simpler systems because you see the solar system if you count eight planets and the sun and for each of these uh, uh, masses you have three variables for position and three for momentum that is a very large number of variables over 40 variables even if you account for conservation of the total momentum total angular momentum and energy so we are going to look at much simpler systems and one example of those I discussed before is billiards. So for instance, uh, let me look at the billiard in a circle and I have drawn a trajectory in red here and I can describe it in the following way. So I have an angle phi 1 here that tells me at which point I start on the boundary and then I have an angle theta 1 here which tells me in which direction I will go. And then I have a second angle phi 2 and a third angle phi 3 and angles theta 2, theta 3 and so on. And one thing I said is that instead of theta n we like to take uh, the variable un which is minus the cosine of theta n because with uh, these variables the map that says how phi and theta change with time is actually area preserving. So here the map has a very simple form. It is simply given by phi n plus 1 is equal to phi n plus omega of un and un plus 1 is equal to un. So here omega of un is a certain function that you can compute but it's not really important for what follows and I'm not going to repeat it afterwards but phi is an angle so we should take it always modulo 2 pi. And uh, so you see what happens for the circle is that actually u is constant and uh, phi changes by an amount that depends only on u. And depending on whether this omega divided by 2 pi is a rational or an irrational number, we saw that we can have periodic orbits or what is called quasi-periodic orbits. So here is, a, is an image with several what we call orbits. So here I have put phi on the x-axis and u on the y-axis and in the right half there are some trajectories and you see that the orbits are these horizontal lines meaning exactly that u is constant on every orbit. Now one thing I can do is deform this uh, circle to for instance an ellipse and then what happens is that u is no longer constant but we still have these invariant curves. So you see uh, there are two types of curves. There are those in the, here in the center which turn around two points which are actually in a, an orbit of period two and there are other curves which go around that take all possible values of the angle phi. However, it turns out that deforming the circle to an ellipse is a rather special case. So more generally what we could do is start with a billiard in a circle and then deform it in a more complicated way but still smooth. So let's say that we deform it in something that looks a little bit like this. So it's some kind of oscillation around the circle and with a condition that the maximum deformation is still small, it's some parameter epsilon. So what happens in, in this case is that we will still have a certain map, phi n plus 1 
and un plus one and it will look like the previous map however we will have some additional terms which will be of the form epsilon some function of phi n and un and epsilon some function of phi n and un and in principle f and g will also depend on epsilon but i'm not going to write it here and so the question is what can we say on the dynamics of this map when these epsilon f and epsilon g terms are present now here's another example which is called shirikov standard map that i also mentioned before and this is a map that describes what is called a kicked rotator so a uh, rotator is actually a little bit like a pendulum except that gravity is only acting at certain times so the pendulum will actually rotate and from time to time it is kicked by uh, by this term here which is uh, like a, a gravitation term which will instantaneously change its momentum but then it continues rotating with a with a new uh, velocity or momentum and here are some examples of orbits of this map so here i have put q on the x-axis and p on the y-axis for increasing values of epsilon and one thing i talked about before is that so in fact you you have here uh, fixed points in zero zero that you see here 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 and here and also in zero minus one half or zero plus one half so the one in zero zero is actually elliptic at least for epsilon not too large and the other one is hyperbolic and the hyperbolic point actually uh, will create some uh, some chaotic motion because of this mechanism of intersecting heteroclinic orbits but what we are interested in here is that there seem to be for instance here there seems to be a, an invariant curve like this and there's one like this here and even here for still larger epsilon there's a curve like that but here in the last case there seems to be no invariant curve so the aim of this KAM theory is to try to show that when epsilon is not too large we still have invariant curves and this is important for stability because at least uh, for these two-dimensional maps an invariant curve acts like a barrier so when there is an invariant curve orbits on one side will not be able to get to the other side so it somehow confines and stabilizes the orbits so this is the the question so can we uh, show that such invariant curves exist for sufficiently small epsilon now uh, let us look at uh, general family of maps like this so instead of writing n time n and n plus one i write phi hat i hat for the new variables and phi i for the old variables and uh, phi is always an angle uh, an angle modulo to pi epsilon is my small parameter and omega f and g are some given functions and I also assume, which is the case for billiards and most mechanical systems, is that this map is area preserving. Now, there are a few simplifications one can make. So the first one is that we can actually assume that omega of i is equal to i. That is provided omega of i is a monotonous function. So it may be increasing or decreasing, but it shouldn't increase and decrease. And that is just before, uh, because we can actually define a new variable j, which is omega of i. And then we find 
that j hat is equal to j plus epsilon and some new function uh, j bar. And just by changing the definition of f and g, we can actually have uh, this form where omega of i is now replaced by i. Now, a uh, second simplification is that we can always assume that the average of f over phi is equal to zero, and by that I mean that 1 over 2 pi integral from zero to 2 pi f of phi i d phi is equal to zero. And the reason for that is that if this is not the case, I can always include the average of f in the definition of my omega here at the cost of having an omega which will depend on epsilon, but uh, that will not be a problem. And a third simplification is that actually we can also assume that the average of g over phi is zero. And this means, uh, this is actually due to the fact that the map is area preserving. So if you compute what it means to be area preserving. It means that a certain Jacobian has to be one and we can deduce from that that actually G uh, can have, uh, can be assumed to have an average equal to zero. All right, so now what does it mean that we have invariant curves? So, the idea is actually that we are going to try to, to build a certain change of variables. So here I have, I start with a certain map that goes from phi i, and uh, let me call this map capital T, and it goes to phi hat and i hat. Now the, the idea uh, is that we want to build new variables, which I'm going to call Psi and Omega. And they evolve according to a modified map, T bar. And I, I want this transformation between the Phi I and the Psi Omega variables to be an invertible transformation. So it's really a change of variables. Now, let us look for a transformation of the following form. So uh, phi will be psi plus epsilon times some function u of psi and omega. And i will be 2 pi omega plus epsilon v of psi and omega. So I put here the 2 pi because at some point we will want to develop, to expand things in Fourier series and, okay, it's always the question, do you put the two pi or not? And uh, since we are going to talk about rational, irrational rotation numbers, it, it is better to put the two pi here. So here the unknowns are the functions u and v. And the condition that uh, we would like to impose is that the new map, psi hat, omega hat, will have the following simple form. So psi hat is psi plus two pi omega and, phi, and omega hat is omega. So we want the new map after this change of variables to have exactly the type of form we had for the simple maps like for the billiard in a circle. Because this map here, we can uh, actually easily solve uh, since omega is constant and psi just changes by a constant quantity depending on omega, it is trivial to find all values of psi. And if such a transformation exists, at least for some values of this omega, it means that actually we have an invariant curve. So this uh, equation here, where we take uh, psi as a parameter, is actually the parametric equation of an invariant curve. And on the curve, this expression here tells me that 
psi will change by uh, actually by a rotation. So I can draw a, a picture which is something like this. So if I have phi and i here, what I am doing here is that I will have constructed a certain curve and the equation of this curve is so phi is psi plus epsilon u of psi omega and i is equal to a constant 2 pi omega plus epsilon v of the same arguments and omega is fixed here and psi is the parameter that gives me the parametrization of the invariant curve. All right, so now we have to give conditions on the functions u and v for this to be true. So how do we do that? Well, we, we look at this, this uh, diagram up here. And we are going to compute i hat and phi hat in two different ways. And I'm just going to do the computation for i hat. So uh, on one hand, I know that i hat has to be equal to 2 pi omega hat plus epsilon v of psi hat omega hat. So here I've just used this definition again, applied to all variables with hats. So here I actually used uh, the, the definition and now I am going to use this diagram here. So another thing I can do is I can say that I had because of uh, now the expression of the map here is equal to I plus epsilon G of phi and I. Okay, but now I use the, the relation between the i phi variables and the omega psi variables. So I know that i has to be equal to 2 pi omega plus epsilon v of psi omega. And then I have epsilon g and I also reply, replace phi by its expression which is psi plus epsilon u and uh, 2 pi omega plus epsilon v. And I didn't write the arguments of u and v. So now you see what I have done here is that I have expressed phi hat and i hat first in terms of phi and i and then in, in terms of psi and omega. But now I also want this uh, i hat to be given by this other expression. So i hat should be equal to this here. And now since omega hat and, and omega are equal, these two terms are equal. So in the end, I get a certain equation for v. In this equation for v, now if I use this relation here, which is the, the map down here, I have the condition that v of psi plus 2 pi omega and omega minus v of psi and omega has to be equal to g of psi plus epsilon times u and 2 pi omega plus epsilon times v. So this is the equation that v has to satisfy. And as I said, I'm not going to do the computation in detail, but I also get a similar condition for u. So u of psi plus 2 pi omega and omega minus u of psi omega has to be equal to something related to f. All right, so now can we solve this equation? 
Well, that is actually a very difficult equation to solve because you see my unknowns are functions, so u and v, and they appear also on the right hand side of the equation. So it's what is called a functional equation, but it's a highly nonlinear functional equation and it's not at all easy to solve it. Now what we can try to do is uh, at a f as a first step to just ignore these terms here and then we get a much simpler equation which is that this difference of v in two different points is a certain given function g but there's no u no v on the right hand side so what we can try to do is first solve the simplified equation and then from there try by successive steps to build a solution of the full equation. Now, when doing this for the simplified equation, we actually encounter a problem and that is called the problem of small divisors or small denominators. So here I have written my equation, my simplified equation again. And uh, now I don't care about the second argument of V. So I have just this equation here to solve. Now, remember, everything is periodic. Psi is an angle. So one thing we can do is use Fourier series. So G, which is uh, given to me in the problem, I can write it as the sum over K and K once over all non-zero integers of some, uh, let's say, gk times exponential i k psi. So that is a Fourier series, and the gk are some coefficients. Now, I can look for a solution for v, which has a similar expansion. So now here I have vk, e i k psi and I want to compute the vk's. Now how do I do that? Well I plug this into my equation so what I get is that sum over k so v of psi plus 2 pi omega is vk exponential i k psi plus 2 pi omega and that is equal to uh, now to that I should subtract the sum over k of vk e i k psi and that should be equal to g which is the sum over k of gk exponential i k psi. But now I know actually that two Fourier series are equal if and only if all terms in the series are equal so actually what I get is the condition that vk times exponential 2 pi i k omega minus 1 should be equal to gk. Or in other words, vk should be equal to gk divided by 1 no, by exponential 2 pi i k omega minus 1. So that is the condition I get for these vk's. All right, but now you, you see there's a problem because if omega is rational, then exponential 2 pi i k omega can actually be equal to 1. So this can be equal to 1. Actually it will be 1 if uh, omega is of the form p over q and k is uh, equal to q or to a multiple of q. So it won't be possible except for very special g's to solve this equation if omega is a rational number. But now what about irrational numbers? So for irrational numbers, it looks like it is possible to do so, and it is. But then remember, this only gives me a first approximation of the solution, and then I, I want to iterate something. So we have to make sure that this d 
divisor here, this denominator, isn't too small, because if it's too small, at some point I may run into problems. And this is this problem of small divisors. So one observation you can make is that if you use some uh, trig identities, if I take this exponential 2 pi i k, k omega minus 1 modulus squared by a rather straightforward computation, you will find that this is equal to twice the absolute value of the sine of pi k omega. And you see for this to be different from zero, to avoid dividing by, by zero, we should have that k omega is always different from an integer. So now we have to quantify this smallness of the divisors. And there's actually a, a property we can ask of irrational numbers, and that is the property of being diophantine. So if omega is an irrational number, and c is a positive real number, and nu is a real number larger or equal to 1, I will say that omega is diophantine of type c and nu if it satisfies the, the following relations. So for any co-prime p and q, so p any integer, q any non-zero integer, I look at the distance between omega and p over q. So I'm looking at the distance between omega and all possible rational numbers. And this distance should not be too small. So it should be larger than c divided by absolute value of q to the power 1 plus nu. So if this uh, is satisfied, if this is true, we call omega a diophantine number. So diophantine numbers are irrational numbers, but they are a bit uh, more than that. They are sufficiently far away from all rational numbers. So we may wonder whether this is at all possible. And I'm going to give two arguments for the fact that uh, it is possible. So let me take, for instance, the interval 0, 1. And let me look at this condition for different values of p and q. So for instance, I can look at p over q is 0 over 1, which is, of course, simply 0. So I look at the distance between omega and zero, so the absolute value of omega. And since q is equal to one, my condition is that absolute value of omega should be larger than c. And this means that I have to exclude an interval here from zero to c. Now I can do the same for p over q equal 1 over 1, which is of course 1. And then I get the condition omega minus 1 larger than c. And this means that I have to exclude another interval here of length c, of size c, around 1. All right, but now let's look at other values of p and q. So for instance, p over q is equal to 1 over 2. So now my condition is that omega minus 1 half should be larger than c over 2 to the power 1 plus nu. So I have my 1 half here. But you see the interval is a bit smaller now. Instead of having th size a c or 2c, it has a size uh, c over 2 to the nu. So it's a slightly smaller interval here. And if I keep doing this, so another case would be p over q is 1 over 3. And then I get that omega minus 1 third should be larger than c over 3 to the 1 plus nu. So if one third, uh, let's say it's somewhere here, I have to exclude an even smaller interval around one third. And the question I ask is, when I keep doing this for all rational numbers, 
I keep excluding small intervals, will there be something remaining? And you can argue that actually the answer is yes, there will be something remaining if c is small enough. And for this, let us bound above the total removed length of intervals. So I add all these red pieces I, I have removed. And I'm not going to compute it exactly. Let me just bound it above. So I will sum over all p over q. But first, let me sum over all q. And you see, what I do for every q is that I remove an interval of size, which is 2c over uh, q to the 1 plus nu. And then I have to see how many intervals I remove for given q, so how many p's there are. And the number of p's is at most q. It is actually a bit smaller because of this condition of p and q being co-prime, but it is certainly bounded by q. And well, this, this is equal to 2c times the sum over all q of of what? Of 1 over q to the power nu. And this sum, by definition, that is Riemann's zeta function at point nu. And it is known that this is finite for all nu larger than 1. So you see that at least when nu is uh, strictly larger than 1, this argument tells me that this should be possible, because I just have to take c small enough for c times or 2c times zeta of nu to be uh, smaller than 1, which is the length of the interval 0, 1. So this is one argument. And I told you I would give you uh, another argument which is a theorem due to Liouville. This theorem says that all algebraic irrational numbers are actually diophantine. So an algebraic irrational number is an irrational number which uh, is the, the zero, the root of a polynomial of finite degree with integer coefficients. And so one, one example would be square root of 2. So square root of 2, so if I call this omega, then uh, I can take p of x, which is x squared minus 2. And then I have p of, of omega of square root of 2 is equal to 0. So square root of 2 is an algebraic number and we know that square root of 2 is irrational. So square root of 2 is an example of such an algebraic irrational number and it has order 2. Now the claim by Liouville is that so we are going to look at derivatives of the polynomial p at omega and if I find a certain k such that all derivatives up to order k vanish, but then the k plus first derivative of p at point omega is non-zero, then omega is diophantine and with a certain uh, value. So I have a value of nu here, which is n over k plus 1 minus 1. And this has actually uh, to be the case because you see, since uh, my polynomial has its leading coefficient a n different from zero, the, at least the nth derivative cannot be zero. So for instance, what this means for square root of 2, so for square root of 2, so we had p of x is x squared minus 2, and p prime of x is 2x. And so I have p of, so that is omega, p of omega is equal to 0, and p prime of omega, that is 2 square root of 2, that is different from 0. So here I have 
a case where n is equal to 2 and nu uh, no k is equal to 0. And therefore nu, that is 2 over 0 plus 1 minus 1, that is 1. So I know that actually square root of 2 is diophantine of type C1 for a certain C. And this is actually the case for any solution of uh, an equation of degree 2 with integer coefficients. So let us, let me give you the proof of this result, which is uh, actually not very difficult to, to make. So let me write p of x in the form sum j equal from to 0, j going from 0 to n of a j x j. And uh, we assume that a n is different from 0. And now one property of polynomials is that they have isolated zeros. So if a polynomial vanishes on the whole interval, then it is zero everywhere. So therefore, I know that there exists a positive delta with a property that the p of x is different from zero for zero strictly smaller than x minus omega strictly smaller than delta. All right, and now I want to prove this Diophantine condition. So I fix a certain number p over q, a certain rational number p over q. And then I, let me look at two cases. So first, a very simple case is, is if omega minus p of uh, q is larger than delta. So in that case, my condition is act actually satisfied with c equal delta because remember the condition we wanted to, to satisfy is that omega minus p over q should be larger than c over uh, q to the power 1 plus nu. But here, uh, okay, since q is at least 1, c equals delta is, uh, is okay. And now the second case is uh, a complementary case, so omega minus p over q is strictly smaller than delta. And then I'm going to make two observations. So the first one is that if I compute q to the n times p, the polynomial in p over q. So by definition of my polynomial, that will be the sum j going from 0 to n, a j, then I will have p over q to the j, and I multiply this by q to the n. And now you see the observation is that the a j are integers, p and q are integers, and so the only thing at the denominator is this q to the j, but it is multiplied by q to the n. So this has to be an integer. And since I know that here, because of, of, this, uh, of uh, this condition here, I know that p evaluated in p over q is different from zero. So I have an integer which is non-zero so it has to be uh, at least one in absolute value. So this tells me that q to the n times p evaluated in p over q is larger or equal to one. So that was the first observation. Now the second observation uh, is actually that I can use Taylor's formula. So I can use Taylor's formula to write that p of p over q that is equal to, so I expand around omega, so it's p of omega plus a certain sum. So let me go take j, go from 1 to k, and then I take the jth derivative of p at omega, I divide by j factorial, that's the for, that's Taylor's formula, 
And then I have p over q minus omega to the power j. And then I have a remainder. And the remainder, one way of writing it is to say that that is the k plus first derivative of p at some point z, and z is some point between omega and p over q. So the claim is that there exists such a z, such that the remainder is given by this, this derivative over k plus 1 factorial times p over q minus omega to the power k plus 1. And now the observation is that actually p of omega is equal to 0. All these derivatives are equal to 0, so the only term remaining in this uh, Taylor expansion is the remainder here. And this tells me that if I take the absolute value of p in p over q, that is bounded by some constant m, which is uh, okay related to my to the derivative of my polynomial here, times p over q minus omega to the power k plus 1. Right? So that, that is a bound on this term here. Remember that I'm in an interval of size delta, so there's uh, no problem of uh, p over q or omega going to infinity. And I can now invert this to obtain that omega minus p over q, which is what I want to estimate, is larger than 1 over m times absolute value of the polynomial evaluated at p over q. And this to the power 1 over k plus 1. And now I use my observation here, my first observation, which tells me that p of p over q is larger than 1 over q to the n. And so this tells me that this is larger than 1 over some constant m times q to the n to the power 1 over k plus 1. And maybe I put an absolute value here. And this is exactly what I wanted to prove, because this gives me my exponent nu. So if I plug this in this definition here, I get this nu here. So this is this theorem by Liouville. Okay, le let me just emphasize that this is not optimal. So uh, there, there is an improvement by Roth that gives uh, more precise values on, on the smallest nu you can take. But anyway, this will be enough for us. Now, let me return to this question of invariant curves. And you see, so we had to solve equations of the form v of psi plus 2 pi omega and omega minus v of psi and omega. And that should be equal to some g at psi plus epsilon u to pi omega plus epsilon v and uh, a similar equation for u. And as I said, that is difficult because uh, the unknown functions u and v appear also on the right-hand side. But okay, that is formally uh, some equation f of u and v equals zero, where f is uh, this complicated uh, combination of v at different points and of, of g and of f. But what I just said is that for Diophantine omega, I actually can find a solution to the simpler equation v naught of psi plus 2 pi omega omega minus v naught of psi and omega is equal to g of psi 2 pi omega using these Fourier series. Now, 
this is not a solution of my equation. So if I plug this into my equation, I will have that f of u0, v0, will be something of order epsilon. So it's not the solution, it's an approximation of the solution. And now what you could want to, to try is to use some kind of iter iteration. So you start with this v0 and, and u0, you have an approximation of the solution and then you want to improve this and have some iterative procedure that will hopefully converge to a solution. And there are several ways of doing this. So one of them being basically to use some kind of Taylor expansions. But the, the difficulty there is that usually you don't get very good bounds on, on the error. So once you improve this u0 v0, you may get something such that, so some u1 v1, and so now you find some u1 v, v1 such that f of u1 v1 is order of epsilon squared maybe. And you iterate this, but uh, the coefficient here in front of the epsilon squared may grow with the iterations and it doesn't, it shouldn't go too fast. Now there's one very, uh, very uh, good idea that these people, I think that one goes back to Kolmogorov, which is to use Newton's method. So let me recall what Newton's method is. So assume I, I want to solve the equation f of x equals zero. And I don't know the exact solution, but I have an approximation of the solution. So here I give an example in dimension one. So let's say that at some point, at some iteration, I have this xn which is not the solution, but it's not too far from the solution, which is here. And then what you do in Newton's method is that you, you do this. So you draw the tangent, so the blue line here, that is the tangent to f at the point with coordinates xn, f of xn, and you look where it intersects the uh, x-axis and that point you call xn plus 1 and that point should be closer to uh, the solution you're looking for. That's not always true, but it's true if xn is close enough already to the solution. And then you iterate this. So an example would be again to find square root of 2 without knowing how to compute a square root. But let me first uh, give you the formula of xn plus 1 in terms of xn. So the idea is here I have a triangle. So one side has length f of xn, the other side has length xn minus xn plus 1, and the derivative of f at point xn, that is the slope of this uh, segment here, that will be equal to f of xn divided by xn minus xn plus 1. And I can solve this for xn plus 1 and I find that xn plus 1 is equal to xn minus f of xn over f prime of xn. So this is Newton's method. So if I take as an example So I want to compute square root of 2 and I only know how to compute, let's say uh, I know how to multiply and to take inverses, but I don't know how to take a square root. So one thing I can do is I take for f of x, x square minus 2. So square root of 2 is uh, a solution of f of x equals 0. And so f prime of x is equal to 2x. And then what I, I get is that xn plus 1 is equal to xn minus xn squared minus 2 divided by 2xn. 
In this I can also rewrite as xn over 2 plus 1 over xn. Okay, and how fast does this converge to square root of 2? So my claim is uh, that if, let me, let's say that I take, I start with x0 equal 2, and I plug this in and I get 3 over 2, and then I plug this in and I get 17 over 12, and then I get something like 577 over 408. And this will converge to square root of 2. But the point is that it actually converges very fast. And to see that, one little computation you can do is that you compute xn plus 1 minus square root of 2. And uh, so I rewrite this by putting uh, everything uh, with the same denominator, what I get is that if I do the computation, I get xn square minus 2 square root of 2xn plus 2 over 2xn. And that is the same as xn minus square root of 2 squared over 2xn. And I can do the same computation with a plus sign here, and then I just get a plus sign here and a plus sign here. And this implies that xn plus 1 minus square root of 2 over xn plus 1 plus square root of 2 will be equal to xn minus square root of 2 over xn plus square root of 2 squared. And the xn plus square root of 2 at the denominator is not, not very important here. What's important is the numerator. And you see that after each iteration, this error is squared. So if you start with an error that is small enough, at each step, the error is squared. That means that if at some step you have the the first, uh, the two first digits are correct, then after one iteration, it will probably be the four first digits which are correct, and after one more iteration, you will have eight correct digits and 16 correct digits. So it converges extremely fast. It's much faster than exponential convergence. Now, the idea of this KAM theory is that you combine these ideas. So you combine this approximate resolution of the equation for UNV with this diophantine omega and Newton's method. And this uh, theory was elaborated by these three people. So Andrei Kolmogorov, who is uh, probably the best known of these three people who did a lot of contributions in particular to probability theory and uh, turbulence and other things, and his uh, student Vladimir Arnold, who is also known for many contributions to dynamical systems and, uh, and uh, other domains like uh, geometry, and uh, Jürgen Moser, so the first two were Russian or Soviet mathematicians, and Jürgen Moser was German, but he lived for a long time in, in Switzerland at the ETH in Zürich, and they uh, proved a series of theorems that I can kind of summarize in the following way. So here I speak about inv invariant tori. So tori here is the generalization of invariant curves or circles to higher dimensions. So a torus in dimension one is like an invariant circle. And what they say is that Okay, you have uh, an integrable Hamiltonian system that would be like my billiard in a circle or Chirikov's map for epsilon equals zero. And the rotation number that is this omega or some higher dimensional analog, and I assume that it satisfies a Diophantine condition. And then the claim is that these invariant circles or tori will survive when I perturb 
this Hamiltonian system by a quantity which is small enough. And the history of uh, this result, as I understand it, is that Kolmogorov first gave this idea. So in particular, he had this idea of using Newton's method, but he didn't work out all the details. And then on the one hand, Vladimir Arnold uh, was so worked on the on the case of uh, Hamiltonian differential equations. And I've been told that Jürgen Moser, who was a student of Siegel, kind of independently also worked uh, on that problem. And at some point, he heard that Vladimir Arnold was working on that. And since he was really a gentleman, he decided to not uh, try to work exactly on the same. So even though maybe he had similar results to those of, of Arnold, he, uh, he gave a, a slightly different result. So Vladimir Arnold gave this general theorem on differential equations, but assuming the, them to be very regular. And Jürgen Moser gave a, a result for iterated maps, but he didn't have to assume them to be infinitely differentiable. Actually, uh, the fun fact is that he only uh, needed 553 derivatives for, uh, for the map. And now, it may seem uh, actually a not very useful improvement to say that my map has to have only 553 continuous derivatives instead of infinitely many. But it is actually uh, an improvement, and later on people were able to reduce this to uh, much lower values. I, I think it is two, the smallest value you find. And so basically uh, all these proofs of these people use this idea of solving this equation for u and v by iterations and using uh, this uh, Newton method to, uh, to do the iterations. Uh, however, however, there are many difficulties. And one difficulty is that when you solve this uh, equation we've discussed before with Fourier series, actually you, you tend to lose derivatives. So for a given g, you find a v, and you can quite easily approximate its uh, so if, if you know uh, you have bounds on the derivatives of g, you can bound v, but uh, with fewer derivatives. So one idea of Moser was to use some approximation arguments to make the g more regular and then not to lose uh, too much precision. And there's one consequence of this theorem that I mentioned in a, in a previous talk which is now for elliptic fixed points of area preserving maps. And the claim was that, so you, you have a certain area preserving map. So you have a fixed point and you linearize the map around this fixed point and the eigenvalues, because it's area preserving, will all, always occur in pairs of inverses of each other. And the claim is that if these eigenvalues are not cubic or quartic roots of unity, then uh, this point will be stable, uh, provided you have some additional condition, which is uh, involves higher order derivatives, but only up to order three. So uh, the idea without going into detail is the following. So when you have such a point, you can rewrite the map in the neighborhood of this point in the form z hat is lambda z plus some nonlinear term. So g here uh, will be something of order two. And lambda, since my point is elliptic, will be complex of modulus one. So it will be of the form e to the two pi i theta. Now, uh, one thing you can try to do in these cases is to simplify the g here. 
by some nonlinear changes of variables. And this is called computing a normal form. And what you can do using these conditions on lambda is that you can replace the general G by something of the form C1 Z modulus squared times Z plus higher order terms. HOT stands for higher order terms, so terms of degree 4 and higher. And this is not always possible, but it is possible if lambda is not a cubic or quartic root of 1. And then what you do is that you use polar coordinates. So you write z as, which is complex, as r to the times e to the i phi. And you compute now uh, the evolution of r and of phi. So how do you do that? Well, you see uh, r hat will be the modulus of z hat, so you compute uh, z hat times its conjugate and you you obtain a certain result and you take the square root and that way you obtain the r hat and you do then something similar for phi hat. So the map you get is phi hat r hat is equal to phi plus 2 pi theta plus some uh, coefficient c1 times r squared plus some higher order terms of order r to the 3 and r hat is r plus some c2 times r to the 3 plus something of higher order. And these uh, lowercase c1 and c2 are related to this uppercase c1 here. And uh, now you see if these terms here were not there I would again have a, a rotation as before. So I want to consider these terms as a small perturbation and this you can do for instance by writing because r is small so you write r as square root epsilon times i and then you get a map which has the form phi hat equals phi plus something i hat is equal to i plus something and here okay you have epsilon times a function g and here let me write the something as omega of i plus epsilon f and omega of i that is equal to 2 pi theta but i've also put uh, the, the term coming from this guy here c1 epsilon i now you see uh, if I had just kept this thing here, this KAM theorem would show that if theta is a, a Diophantine irrational, then I have an invariant curve. And since I have an invariant curve, it means that the interior of this curve is invariant, so the point is stable. But here I can actually do better because now I have an omega of i which is not constant, so it's not equal to 2 pi theta. It is, uh, by changing i, it is a bit different, and, and that makes the result more general, because actually I'd, theta does not need to be irrational or diophantine. It can even be rational, but thanks to this term here, as long as c1 is non-zero, uh, I can uh, at some point get uh, a Diophantine number and I can apply the theorem. Right, so now let's return to the question of the stability of the solar system. So when people develop this KAM theory they were kind of hoping that you could use it to prove that the solar system is stable. However, uh, there are uh, several problems where it is not enough and one of them is a problem of degeneracy of the frequency and that is related to what I just said that I, I have this omega of i which is non-constant and that allows me to 
change the frequency a little bit to get to diophantine numbers. And the solar system is has a special structure which is very degenerate and actually this this is not true, this condition on, on omega. However, there has been recent progress, uh, for instance, by the Italian mathematician uh, Gabriella Pizzari, that allows to extend come theory to these degenerate cases. So this actually you can do. Now, a second problem is called Arnold diffusion. That has to do with the fact that we are in higher dimension for the solar system than for our iterated maps. So for these maps, as soon as I have an invariant curve, it acts as a barrier and it makes things stable. But in higher dimension, due to geometrical reasons, this is no longer true. And uh, so it is assumed that even if you have these invariant tori, it is still possible for orbits to diffuse between them, but it will take a very long time. But as far as I know, this is still rather poorly understood. And a third problem is that actually in our system, even though epsilon is quite small, so epsilon is something like the ratio between the masses of uh, Jupiter and the Sun, it is actually not small enough to guarantee that this theory works. And so how, what about the stability of the solar system? Well, there has been work in the last uh, 30 years or so by different people, but the first one of them was uh, the French mathematician Jacques Lascar. And he did very extensive numerical simulations. And these uh, numerical simulations, uh, they were able to integrate numerically the motion of the solar system over very long time spans. And it is time spans of millions or even billions of years. Now, the way he did that, it's actually not possible to do that if you describe the solar system in normal coordinates in three-dimensional space, like you take positions and velocities of all planets. However, uh, you can do something using so-called uh, Delaunay variables. And uh, in Delaunay variables, uh, you, you have uh, actually positions of, uh, so you describe each planet by an elliptical orbit which slowly deforms over time. And so the idea is that if you use here a coordinate system x, y, z, like this, then you have uh, a certain plane in which uh, uh, this orbit is located. And uh, here I have the angular momentum which is perpendicular to this plane. And I, I have different coordinates here. So here the important quantities are A, which are the semi-minor axis of my ellipse, and E is the eccentricity. And the Lunet variables were used by the astronomer de Lunet in the 19th century. And they are so-called action angle variables, which always exist for Hamiltonian systems, which are integrable or slightly perturbed integrable systems. And the idea is instead of using the six variables, which are x, y, z, and v, x, v, y, v, z, you use three action variables, which are like momenta. So lambda is square root a, a being here the semi-minor axis. You have the amplitude of the angular momentum, which is, you can show is equal to square root of a times square root of one minus e squared, e being the eccentricity here. And you have the z component of L, which is equal to the same thing times the cosine of i. And i is the angle here, which is the inclination of the orbit. And then you have three conjugated angle variables. And the angle variables are, so the first variable, which is conjugated to lambda, 
so it is uh, related so if I call this angle here E it is equal to E minus E times the sine of E that is called the mean anomaly and it gives the position of the planet on its orbit and then omega lowercase omega is this angle here which is called the argument of the perihelion so it tells me how uh, the axis of the ellipse are located uh, in, in space and capital omega is the angle here and this is called the longitude of nodes so that gives me the position of the line here which is the intersection between the plane of the ellipse and the xy plane and the thing is that in this system of coordinates if you neglect all interactions between planets the dynamics is very simple because everything is conserved so all actions are conserved and actually also the two omegas are conserved and the only thing that changes in time is m and it changes in a very simple way it is just a, a rotation and then when you add the perturbation you get of course many more terms it becomes very complicated but you can do a procedure which is called averaging and averaging means that you, you average out all the fast motion so the motion of m and maybe also for other variables like the omegas and you find a simpler system and that one can be integrated numerically but the difficulty is to find this average system to a high enough degree of precision and that is what uh, Lascar did and what he found is that actually the solar system is chaotic it is not very strongly chaotic so it is stable on time scales of something like 10 million years so you won't notice any chaotic effect on time scales of at least 10 million years but on longer time scales things may happen and what may happen is that for instance mercury can get a very eccentric orbit and then possibly even there could be collisions between mercury and venus and uh, things like that so it doesn't mean that this will happen because with these averaged equations you can you cannot know where exactly a planet is on its orbit you can only say that the orbits which are these slowly deforming ellipses at some point can intersect however even though it is not a, a full proof it is a strong indication that in fact the solar system is unstable on extremely long time scales though it is not something we need to be worried about for us and the generations to come because the time scales are so long all right so this was it on this kolmogorov arnold moser theory and its application to the solar system i hope you enjoyed the talk so thank you very much for listening for watching and hope to see you again soon take care bye